they're telling me they're telling me that this is a shorter class, so we're going to bow in prayer and get started. Father, we are so very thankful that you've let us once again assemble. We are thankful for all of the classes that are happening this week, and we are thankful for the lessons that you've given us through all parts of your Holy Word. But we're especially thankful for what the Holy Spirit has spoken in the book of First Peter this week. We pray that you will help us to be women who are moldable, women who are um, anxious to learn the truths from this book and to apply them in our families, in our relationships. And today we pray especially that you will help us as we minister the grace. And it's in the name of Jesus who is the one who brought grace to our lives that we pray. Amen. Okay, am I handling grace right? We're going to be talking this lesson about some things that are a little bit challenging for us. They make us get out of our shell just a little bit. Um, Mag, uh, Rebecca was telling me that earlier in the week, I'm going to tell Maggie and Ella's stories this week. If you can't tell, that's kind of a theme. But um, Ellis is two. And he just, uh, the other day, was she was trying to get him to learn to put on his shoes. She is the uh, queen, the quintessential do-it-yourself mom. She wants them to learn. Maggie's already knows how to do laundry, and that's pretty amazing to me. But Ellis, she was teaching him to do his shoes, put on his socks and shoes all by himself. And he said, but that's so hard. <laughs> and she said, you can do hard things. He said, go ahead. Go ahead and say the word. Say the word, Mom. And he, she said, what word do you want me to say? He said, persevere. <laughs> <laughs> Our verse is 1 Peter 4, verse 10 and following. It says, as each one of you has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's talking here about gifts, and it's probably talking about gifts, both miraculous and non-miraculous. As we know, in that era when Peter was writing, there were miraculous gifts. But it's also probably talking about gifts of artistry, gifts of knowledge that we attain by studying. It's probably talking about gifts of hospitality, gifts of charity, gifts of fellowship, non-miraculous gifts, and everybody in this room has a natural gift, and most of you have many. And I know that it's the desire of everybody in this room to use whatever God has given you, abilities He has given you, to glorify Him. And of course, that is the purpose of our being here this week. Kathy Plant has a great gift of art, a great gift of art, and a great gift of putting through that art, putting knowledge of the Bible into children. She just has that great gift. And I was blown away when I walked in the auditorium this morning and looked up at the baptistry and the new tree that she planted up there. And she... Um, she very artistically with her 12-foot letter all day Saturday. Um, now, I want to know, does that letter go in the water or is there a space there? Okay, there's a space behind the water. I could just see her waiting in there and climbing that ladder. Mm-hmm. And I know that those leaves, the next, if I get to come during the holidays, those fall leaves won't be there. You'll do something else. And it is amazing. That gift to me is amazing. We were in Israel together and I wanted to give something special to the, the lead, John Moore who was leading us through Israel. And I said, Kathy, you know, you could just make us a little card. She doesn't ever just make a little card. <laughs> she just, pres uh, she just uh, designs and creates a piece of art that is frameable. That's what she does. And so that little card was that. 
I, was, I met her, her husband Mike was the first person I came in contact with when I came in the building today. He was standing right there, gave me a big hug, and, and, and I said something about Kathy, and he said, yeah, all day. We got back from Charleston, I think it was, on Friday night and all day Saturday. She carried that 12-foot ladder back and forth, and she made a tree in the baptistry, and I, that is her gift. And her friend sitting here beside her, Linda, her gift is making cards along among many other gifts, cooking and hospitality. And I have enjoyed all of those gifts and many more, and they are being used for the glory of God. Tell you, we talked this morning about going through the dark days. I probably got 25 cards from her, handmade cards during a very difficult period of my life. And I could go on and on. Miss Dottie back there, she can plan things. Miss Jocelyn up here, she can be, she, oh, she's a people person. She is a people person and she can rally the troops. I'm telling you, she can, she can rally the troops because she has that administrative skill. She is amazing. I could go with so many people. I could go with Jeannie. I could go with, you take it if you can use it. It's for me. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, so, what, what I'm saying is that God's, and that's what this passage is not, I'm going to say not primarily about, but it is a big meaning of this passage, is that we take our natural gifts and abilities, and they are a part of the multifaceted grace of God. We use them, and we then corporately are able to shine a lot in our communities and show people the grace of God. The primary gift, though, of the grace of God is what? Our salvation is the primary gift of the grace of God. We talked about Romans 5 a little bit this morning. We talked about how that in the grace space there are two things that, that are inextricably linked that make us rejoice when we have access to the grace space. What is it? Anybody? Trials and hope. Those things go together. We're not going to have the depth of hope that God intended for us to have until we go through the dark times in this life because God created this life as a testing ground to prove that we trust Him, that we're going to do life His way even when things are difficult. But at the bottom of that text in Romans 5, it says, it's talking about grace there, but it says at the very bottom, after it discusses hope and trials together, it says, because God, while we were yet sinners, Christ came to die for us. And it, you know, prefaces that by saying, scarcely for a righteous man will one die, but for a good man, man some would even dare to die. And then it says, but Jesus Christ while we were yet enemies, or while we were yet sinners, came and died for us. It goes ahead to say that he justified us by his blood so that we can be saved. That is the ultimate gift of grace. Now back to the pas passage that we're talking about in 1 Peter 4.10. It says in the middle of that verse, that passage that I read, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. That is the word of God with the result of glorifying God. If any man minister or serve, I'm going to say if any woman ministers or serves, let her do it by the ability that God gives. That word serve there, I don't know if you've ever looked that up, but it is diakoneo, which is the Greek word from which we get our word deacon. So here, right here, is the sense in which women can be deacons. Don't leave this room and say, Cindy Colley teaches that. Women should be deacons in the church in the office of deacon. I didn't say that. But the Bible does use the derivatives, various forms of the word deacon in the servant sense. Can we do that? And should we be doing that? And all these ladies that I mentioned are diakonos. They are deacons in that sense of serving. And what it means is here, 
If any man serve, let her him serve as of the ability which God gives, that God in all things might be glorified. You take your ability and you serve with it. That's uh, simple, but is that including salvation? Well, in chapter 1, once you look at chapter 1 of um, of First Peter, it says in verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired. So what are we talking about? What's the noun in that sentence besides prophets? Of which salvation, we're talking about salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. They prophesied of the grace that should come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them signified when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ. This is the Holy Spirit told ahead of time about the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. This is obviously a salvation by grace context here. And then it says, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us, Christians, they did minister. The word there is diakoneo, same word. They served up the grace of salvation, which things are now reported to you by those who have preached the what? Gospel. I know I'm getting a little... Th deep maybe into theology here but I just I want you to understand that it's not just our hospitality our love our charity our taking pies to the neighbors it is diakoneo in both verses and it means that Christians serve the gospel they serve the grace. They serve the salvation to other people. And so it was a nail-scarred hand that reached out just before the ascension, the very last thing that our Lord did on this earth, and said, go ye into all the world and teach the gospel. That is being a servant. That is ministering the grace. That really is ministering the epitome of God's grace. That's how we serve the grace. Eight billion people on the planet as of last November. Three million members of Christ's church is the pretty liberal estimate. So eight billion people, three million people know the gospel. And if you do the math there, then every Christian, in order to make sure everyone on the planet knew, would need to teach 2,667 people. I know that those numbers are estimates, but we have a lot of people that need to know the gospel. And Cindy Colley's share of that, if we really did the math, is about 2,670 people. And so my question to me is, and this of course applies to all of us. My question to me is, what am I doing to reach any of those people? I don't know that I will be able to actually tell the gospel story, maybe if I have a lot of rooms in which to teach. But personally, it'd be hard for me to tell the gospel story to 2,670 people. But at the same time, I'm just going to get practical. I don't want to go before God not having told the gospel story to any people. And I really hope I get to tell it to all of the people that I love. And so it is a little bit difficult, but Romans 1.16 tells us that we should not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God to salvation. Sometimes we start thinking, I can't do this, but I'm not the one who has to do it. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. And so what we are commissioned to do is just point people to the gospel. But we maybe don't trust the power of the gospel. Whatever it is, we habitually, I think, and this is probably going to be the most, um, I don't want to say the most negative class, because when we talk about the gospel being the power of God to salvation, 
what do we have in our hands? I mean, aren't we blessed? We are the elite minority of people who have the blessings that are in Christ. And when you look at Ephesians 1, you know that that's all spiritual blessings. That is the forgiveness of sins. That is redemption. And all spiritual blessings is any blessing that's not material. So any blessing that's going to matter in a hundred years is for the elite people who are in Christ. We are that. We should rejoice in that. But then we should ask ourselves, what is it that makes it hard for us to share the gospel with other people? Because I think we all know that sometimes it makes our knees knock and gives us butterflies in our stomach to talk about spiritual things with people. Sometimes I think we think, we look at other people and we think, mm, I might just be wasting my time to talk to that person about the gospel. I'm going to give you some things that I'm not proud of, but some personal things that have taught me a lot as I tried to reach out to teach people the gospel. And the first one is about a woman named Nori who came into our services. And she was way back in the back of the auditorium when I first saw her. She was Hispanic and she had, not that that matters, but she had a baby on her hip. No other people were with her. And she had several her belongings, I think, in um, worn bags. And I saw her through a mass of people in the back of the auditorium. And I thought, I don't think I've seen her before. You know, I really should go up and, and welcome her. I should ask her if she'd like to study the Bible with me. Sometimes if we don't ask that question right when we meet the person, we don't get that chance later to ask that question. And so I thought that, but I thought, you know, what are the chances? All these people are around me and they're talking to me and I'm paying attention to their children and I'm making visitors feel welcome here. What are the chances if I leave these people and go over there and talk to her that she would listen about the gospel? She's probably, I'm not telling you that this is a good thing. Please don't think I'm telling you this is a good thing. This is a flaw of Cindy Colley. But I thought, she's probably not even legal. And she, there would be that hurdle to overcome. And she's got that baby, but there's no husband with her. She's, she's probably not even married. And, you know, if, if there is a husband, then what does he do? And they're probably, I could think, and I'm not proud of it, of a million reasons why I probably was wasting my time. But I made myself, I made myself walk back there and ask her if she wanted to study the Bible. And she said no. And in my mind, I thought, yeah, just like I thought. She's not interested. That was a waste of my time. But I gave her a little card that had my number on it and said, call me if you change your mind. And on Tuesday, she called me and said, I changed my mind. I want to study Bible with you. And so her English was really broken, and I thought, this is going to be challenging. But of course, I went to study the Bible with her. And as I talked to her, I understood that her husband did have a good job in carpentry. That's a pretty good career from the Bible. And, and he was a, a busy man, and sh they were in a tiny little apartment. But I studied the Bible with her on successive Tuesdays. Every Tuesday we would get together to study the Bible. They did have a green card and they were responsible people. And as I studied with her, we got to the part about repentance. Well, I began talking to her about what repentance means. It's the hardest part of the plan of salvation. Of course it's the hardest part. You know, we hear a lot of flack about baptism. Baptism is not even anything we do. Baptism is something we submit to. But repentance, oh, that's the work. There's the work. And as I talked to her about repentance, she said, we, we are married. We, you know, we don't, I don't curse. And we talked about all these different kinds of areas. And finally, I just thought, okay, I'm going to have to address it. Because outside on the little deck of this apartment was a giant pile of beer cans. And so I said, well, 
we need to, to abstain from drunkenness and alcohol if we're going to obey Christ. And she, she said, why do you ask that? And I said, well, that. And she said, oh, those are beer cans. She said, we have neighbors who's very poor. We collect those cans. We pick up cans. We give to him. He gets money for food. We not drink. You know, every, well, one Tuesday she said, I, I not study with you today. And you know, sometimes when that happens, when you're studying with someone, you think, well, that's all over. She's, you know, and a lot of people, you know, a lot of people learn the gospel and never feel any need to obey that gospel, no matter what you say, lots of times. And I thought we probably were there because she knew the gospel. And she's so, the next, I thought I probably won't hear from any, her anymore. I'll check with her. So the next Tuesday, she called me before I could call her and she said, you coming? <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, I, oh yes. And I put my clothes on and I went. And when I got there, I said, so what happened last week? And she said, friend in building, apartment building, asked me to take her to doctor. I took her to doctor and I was shocked. I don't even want to tell you. And I said, what? She said, she was getting abortion. My friend was getting abortion. And she said, so I not let her out of car. <laughs> she, said, <laughs> she said, I drive round and round and round. And then she said, and finally I come upon protesters. <laughs> I was thinking, okay, toasters, what did she see? And finally I got it, protesters. She said, so I put her out there. <laughs> and she said, so in a minute she come back to get in car. She said, not have abortion. She said, so protesters came to my window and they give me this. And it was a $20 bill. She said, it was for my gas. And she said, I not take money to save baby. She said, I tell her I take baby for her. And she said, I not take money to give to, to, to save baby, but they threw in car, so you take, give to your church. <laughs> I'm telling you what, Nori today is a Christian, and Cindy Colley is the pitiful one who thought what a waste of time that might be. I'm just telling you, we need to open up our eyes to realize that we are the only diakoneo of grace that God has on this earth and that we can share that gospel. Sometimes we're nervous that we're going to seem very radical in a pluralistic world. I'm talking about when you go to the store in Jacksonville, Florida, more than in Huntsville, Alabama even, you're going to be in the middle of a bunch of people who don't believe in God, and you're going to be in the middle of some people who are very antagonistic toward the idea of morality, of family values. You're going to be, sadly, in any area of our country, somewhat inhibited because you are going to seem a bit radical in a pluralistic world. I mean, really, when I was sitting down there with the rabbi in the airport on the way here that I told you about this morning, I, here's what he said. He said to me, and I'm going to get back to seeming radical, but he said to me, so those I finally said to him, I said, so Jesus, he said, Jesus was just a good Jew who lived 2,000 years ago, just a good Jew. I said, he was no good if he was not the Son of God. He was a liar if he wasn't the Son of God because he claimed to be the Son of God. And he said to me, so are you going to tell me that four and a half million Jews who were slaughtered by the Nazi regime were all lost people because they didn't believe in Jesus. My husband was sitting there. He said they were lost because of their sin. But they didn't take advantage of the blood that could have saved them. And he said, and you're going to tell me that that guy over there, and he named him, counting his rosary beads while the Jews were being killed, went to heaven? Well, <laughs> he was about to see because we said... Catholicism is not what Jesus came to do. You think that the Christians and the Jews are lost? 
I mean, he thought that was pretty radical. Now, we didn't say it in those words. But I'm telling you, when you go as a New Testament Christian into the world around you, do you mean I'm supposed to stop in five minutes? I'm just going to not stop in five, but I'm going to stop soon after five. But man, this is this 30-minute thing's hard. So, so we, you, will, you will seem radical. As a New Testament Christian, going out into a world that basically, just as Jeannie said this morning, believes, if I think it's right, is right. You're going to seem a bit radical. So, my, we got to have some plan of action. And so my plan, when I go to the store, I'm going to walk over here and get this. I'm probably walking off of some camera. She's back there. Good for her. Um, so I have these little cards that I take, and I just try to distribute them everywhere I go. And it just says, it has a little excited little girl, one of my grandchildren on here. And it says, I'd love to study the most exciting thing with you. Cindy Colley at gmail.com for Bible study. And I just like give these cards to all those people who think I'm radical. And you know what? I have never, except for one time, made anybody mad giving them a card. One time a lady said, I will never study that book. It's her right to say that in America. But most of the time, even those people who think, who don't want to study, are not rude to me. How much trouble is that? So one day I was in Walmart, and I've had more than one person respond to this card, but I was in Walmart this one day, and there was a problem with um, somebody's something that wasn't scanning right, and so it took a long time. She had to change out the tape then, and it took a long time, and I'm so thankful for that problem. Because while I was standing in line, I started talking to this man behind me. He, he said, Man, I'd still rather be in this store, though, waiting in this line than in that other one over there. And I said, yeah, Glenn won't even let me go in there anymore. It's dangerous over there. And we were talking, just having a conversation. And at the end, I had my card for the girl. And this is what you do. And I'll help you make them if you want to make them. But I have my card for the girl. And she, when she hands you the receipt, you say, and here's a card in case you ever want to study the Bible. And then she has at least a contact you're not going to see her in judgment. You might see her lost, but you're not going to see her never even having a contact to the gospel, to the grace that we minister. And so I gave her the card, and I said, and here's one for you, too. It was nice talking to you, and I gave it to that man. And before I got home, the phone was ringing in my car, and, and he was ready to study the Bible. And so he was an old man. And I took my husband with me, and we met him at Arby's the first time. Now he's been into our house several times, and we studied with him for two or three years before he was baptized into Christ. Walmart a card. I'm not real proud of that because all it took was nothing, you know, for me to hand him that card. But figure out what you can do, even in a hostile environment, to introduce people to the gospel. Sometimes we are afraid of rejection. I just want to urge you to put it into your children very early on to invite people to your gospel meetings, to your sparks, to whatever it is you have, and to be very open about Jesus Christ. You speak about Jesus Christ every single time you have the opportunity before your neighbors and before the people with whom you interact. And your children then will grow up with that being second nature. Involve your children in your evangelism because you will quench that fear of rejection before it has a time to, to grow. <coughs> My... Um, Kids, when, I, when they were very young, I was having these people over, and they were lost people to study for the purpose of sitting them around my table. You know, it is easier to talk about the gospel with people you know if it's over food. It's just, that's just the way it is. And so I was having these people over to talk about the gospel, and 
Caleb was little, and I mean, every time I was trying to straighten up my house for that, and that probably was futile, but Caleb sucked the curtains up into the vacuum cleaner, and Hannah dumped out my one of my plants on the carpet just after he did that, so I didn't have a vacuum cleaner because the curtains were tangled up in the vacuum cleaner. And I mean, it was like a tornado here, and I would be cleaning that up, and then I would have this one clean, and then when I would finish that one, there was one over here. And finally, I just said, you guys, y'all are gonna have to go to your rooms. And I caught myself. I was trying to do evangelism, and I was trying to keep them out of it and send them somewhere else. And so I got down on their eye level and I said, we are having some people over tonight. And, and Caleb interrupted me and said, I don't even understand why they're coming. I don't even know them. <laughs> and so I said, this is why. And I was able to talk about souls to those little children and I said, now I need your help. And more importantly, tonight I need your help. I need you tonight to take their children into your room and after they get here, you can get out every game you want to get out. You can get out all the toys, whatever you want to do if you keep them in playing so that their parents can learn the gospel. Involve your children so that you will kind of squelch that fear of rejection before it happens. When I was growing up and I was 13 years old, I guess it was about 12, 13, I had, we had an elder in the church who during our visitation team meetings, we had visitation teams, during those team meetings, he would take the teens and even younger into a different room and show us those old Jewel Miller film strips. Does anybody remember those? Okay, we got some old people here. So those Jewel Miller film strips and he would show us those and ding those and show us how to go through those. And I'm just telling you what, I was 13 and I thought I can do this. And so we had this bus program. Anybody else have a bus program when you're like, okay, we are reliving the 70s. So, so in, in, we had this program and we brought these little girls to, to worship and they lived on the, this was the civil rights movement time. I mean, it was. We were just a few years out of the 16th Street bombing and this was Birmingham, Alabama. And we picked these girls up in a part of town where really it wouldn't have been safe for me to go. And I went to school with them and it was the first year of forced integration in Birmingham, Alabama. I'm telling you, it was a volatile time. I know that there were incidents that happened <coughs> on both sides of the spectrum. I do know though that my ponytail was jerked and pulled all the way down the hallway by somebody that I did not even know. I know that one day I got off the school bus and there were bottles flying above my head and crashing into people and I remember running all the way across the football field so that I could be by myself and breathe and not be in the middle of that gang fight. That's just how Birmingham, Alabama was at that time. So I told my parents that I wanted to ask these, these girls that were my age to study the Bible with me. They were brown girls. And I said, I hope they will. We'll be praying about that. And so they said yes. And so my parents weren't going to let me go to that neighborhood. Their parents, if they had parents, weren't going to let them come to my neighborhood. That was how it was then. And so my parents, we baked cookies and my parents went and picked them up with me and took us to the church building. And I sat there and showed them those ding, 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 Joel Miller film strips. And they loved them. And when it got to number four, you know what happens there? I said, do you want to be baptized? And they wanted to be baptized. 13 year old girls wanted to be baptized. And I don't know what the gospel has done for them, but I know what that moment did for me. I watched them go under the water and I decided that I was gonna tell this news with the Jewel Miller film strips or however I could 
with everybody I could throughout my lifetime. That's not any big thing for me. But that is Romans 1.16. It is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Sometimes we make it more complicated than it needs to be. Sometimes we say, I've never... I've never even seen the Joel Miller film strips or the videos, or I've never been to a World Video Bible School evangelism seminar. I've never heard Rob Whitaker. I don't know about Back to the Bible. I've not, I've not been in Fishers of Men. Sometimes we say things like that. But we need to decide that we can take advantage of those things, but we're just going to live talking about Jesus. We got to talk to people. That means we got to be friendly. That means sometimes when it's uncomfortable, we got to say, here's a card about Bible. So this, this is a different one that invites people to worship. Sometimes we just got to invite people to worship. You know, I'm big on books. I have a lot of books in my basement and I just love being able to take an invitation to somebody, a, a girl who's waiting on us at a restaurant and say, here's a book that I wrote. And if you want to if you want to study it and talk, if she's talking about Christ especially, if you want to study it, I'd love to talk to you about it. Here's where we worship too. I want to leave this with you. Just talk to people. We can all talk to people. And when you tell a coworker that you can't come on Wednesday night, don't just say I'm busy on Wednesday night. Tell them what you're doing on Wednesday night. And get them interested in you know, invite them to the family day, the friends and family weekend, the ladies Bible class, the bear making for the hospital, whatever it is you do, just say, I'm busy doing this and it's so fun. You want to come one time? Just talk to people about Christ and live like a Christian. I, I know that I have to hush because they're going to start another one. But I want to, I want to tell you something that happened just last week. I'm not really proud of this one either, but I was in on the beach. Colleanna, my granddaughter, is seven. They've gone through a pretty rough time. She wanted to go to the beach because she can't, she's been here to this one, but she can't remember it because she was too little. And so she wanted to see the ocean. And so for her birthday, that's what she wished for. Well, Papa and I decided she probably should see the ocean. And so I rented a condo down in the at Perdido Key, actually, and um, I took I took those children, the three of them and their mama, and we went to the beach, and it was great. It was exactly what we needed for them until two nights in, and the next morning I got up, and there was this note on my door. It says, "Please," underlined twice, "stop banging and running." You are too loud, underlined twice, exclamation point. You have woken us up for two days and nights. You are ruining our vacation. Your kids are loud. Thank you, exclamation point. Well, in the first place, I know I'm the grandmother, but they weren't really that loud. <laughs> I mean, they. I know I'm the grandmother, but the walls were kind of thin. And I know one time Ezra tripped over my luggage and fell into the closet. And that closet, I know, was paper thin between that condo and the next. I know it was. But I mean, I could hear kids running all the time. Up above me, beside me, over here. But, I, you know, and at first, my reaction was to just go over there and say, we paid our money just like you did. <laughs> we have kids just like you do. And I've heard yours. I mean, you really, that is the devil that wants you to talk. But then I started thinking, I was, you know, you were in my skin. Because I was thinking about diakoneo, ministering the grace. And I thought, what am I going to do about this? What are we going to do about this? I didn't even tell Hannah, though, because she had a lot of things to think about. And I just wrote a little note and took it over and put it under her rug and said, I'm so sorry. I would never want to ruin your vacation and I'm so sorry. It was Colleanna's seventh birthday. They've had kind of a rough year and we were trying to give them a little bit of healing time, but that is no excuse for letting them be loud. We are leaving in the morning, but I'm gonna try my best to keep them quiet. I am so 
sorry. I hope the Lord blesses you with a great time. So, that's all I thought I would ever hear. Dear one in the morning, thank you for your heartfelt note. I'm sorry I was so harsh, especially not knowing the circumstances. I feel really bad for you. I don't mind how loud they are now. Smiley face. <laughs> I should have been more patient. I'm sorry. I had an awful migraine all night, so I wasn't. Well, I will say that you and your kids are going to be much better off in the long run now that you're healing. You are a great mom. She thought I was the mom. Who is doing everything to make them happy. They will always remember this birthday trip. I have a 10 year old and do everything I can to make her have a good childhood. A homeschooler, I don't know you, but I can tell from your sweet note that you are an amazing woman. <laughs> I serve an amazing God. I hope you can forgive me and accept my apology. May the Lord bless you and keep you and shine his face upon you and give you peace. Please run and have fun. <laughs> And so, I just took a Digging Deep book over and another little note that thanked her for her patience. I can tell you're a woman who believes God's Word. And here's a book in case you have, in a minute, you know, I have to meet you. You did not do this. God did this. And she just was all about it. And she said, where are you from? And I said, Huntsville, Alabama. That's where I live, she said. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you, I know I have to go, but she is a member of Digging Deep. Wow. She is in the group. She is, and today, a request from somebody else with her same last name, which is a really weird last name. So I know it's her sister-in-law or her mother-in-law or somebody else. She is responding. She is asking questions. And I'm just going to tell you, that what I wanted to do was not what I ended up doing. And so what we have to do to minister the grace is not what we want to do. What we have to do to minister the grace is get out of our comfort zone and live for Christ. I'm going to just say one more thing and then you're going to be late in the auditorium. I'm sorry. When you say, I'm nervous or I am afraid, or I will jeopardize this friendship, or even I'm just so busy. Notice what every sentence started with. Ah, 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 ah. But when I say, this is the power of God to salvation, this, and I will not be ashamed of it. It's the bread of life. I'm just one bread beggar offering it to another. It's the water of life. I'm just a broken vessel trying to give someone a drink. It's the message of salvation, but I'm just the postman. It's the sword, but I'm just the one wearing the armor. It's the gospel of peace, but I'm just the one who put on the shoes, the preparation for the gospel of peace. It's the death and burial and resurrection. It is the grace of God. It's the blood. And I'm just one washed person offering it to someone who needs the cleansing. So many things I wanted to say but don't have time. I want to challenge you, just challenge you, to 200, 2,670 people. Pick one. Just pick one and get started. Okay, I love you, and I'm sorry I made you late. <laughs> <laughs>